Good evening, my friends. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the channel for everyone who's new here and welcome back, old friends. This is This Present Darkness. This is a series about the hidden truths in our experience of the world, the hidden supernatural truths that we're all uh, hoping to learn more about so that we can grow spiritually and do the things that we need to do to get to where we want to go when this world is over, right? Uh, my name is Ursula Bielski, and I'm your host on this show as well as on the channel, Ursula Bielski's World of Supernatural. I am a 35-year uh, paranormal researcher, folklorist, and historian, and I am a lifelong Catholic, uh, learning a lot about um, the dangers of uh, all the kinds of different kinds of paranormal research that I did during my life, a lot of dangers of the occult trying to share some of that with you guys so you don't make some of the same mistakes that I made. And tonight we're going to be talking a little bit more, uh, like I said, it's not a book club, but we have been talking about books uh, the last couple of weeks. Last week we talked about uh, Father Malachi Martin, the late Father Malachi Martin, and his book Hostage to the Devil, as well as some of his other books about the Catholic Church, different conspiracy theories like the Third Secret of Fatima, uh, Satanic Masses at the Vatican and uh, in the United States uh, by certain bishops and priests. And uh, also Malachi Martin's book, Hostage to the Devil's uh, inspired Netflix uh, film of the same name, which I also recommend that, that you guys see. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about one of Malachi Martin's protégés, and that is a guy by the name of Dr. Scott, uh, M. Scott Peck. Scott Peck was a very influential psychiatrist who um, wrote a number of very influential books during his long career. He also is now deceased. He died a number of years ago, um, but he was an American psychiatrist who wrote, um, the first book that he wrote was um, The Road Less Traveled, which you might've read. It's one of the best selling uh, self-help books of all time. In fact, it was one of the first um, self, if not the first uh, sort of spiritual self-help book uh, that became popular um, after his release of that book. And we're going to talk a little bit about that during this program. But mostly we're going to be talking about this book, The People of the Lie, which is about human evil and uh, also differentiating, differentiating between evil and um, sin and what is uh, an evil person and what is a possessed person? Like, what's the difference? Um, Dr. Peck also wrote another book about evil and possession and exorcism after he wrote this book. It's called Glimpses of the Devil, in which he goes into more in, more in depth on the two cases of possession that he mentions briefly in this book. So we're going to be talking about these. Uh, before we talk about the actual book, The People of the Lie, I'm going to just give you some background on... Um, Dr. Peck, and excuse me for looking down, I'm working on getting like a better program here, like maybe a teleprompter or something, so I can seem like I'm just looking at you rather than looking at my notes. I do talk off the cuff most of the time, as you guys know, but, you know, from my incredible wealth of knowledge, <laughs> just kidding, uh, I always say like, I, don't, I know like everything that you don't need to know about anything. <laughs> But uh, I'm glad you, I hope you find it useful to some extent. Anyway, Dr. Peck, uh, let's see, he was born in New York City. His parents were Quakers and he was raised a Protestant when he was young. Um, but later on, and he always said throughout his life, he was mostly involved in Eastern religions and he was a Buddhist for a while and um, was involved in other uh, Eastern religions before at the age of 40, he being baptized as a Christian. And this was a, I guess he was dom uh, baptized in a non-denominational church, but um, it was kind of, it's thought that it's, he was generally like an evangelical Christian. Um, but we'll go on to see that a lot of his ideas never really came to that Christian fruition. And he still maintained a lot of those um, those other Eastern religious ideas and came to more of like a global new agey type theology in his later life. 
Um, He had troubles with school when he was young. His parents sent him to the prestigious boarding school, Exeter, uh, Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire when he was 13. And I guess he had a big, a lot of trouble there. He hated school and, uh, but he figured it out and he went on and he got a BA from Harvard and an MD from Case Western Reserve University. So he figured all that out. Now he worked in the government uh, in some capacity for many years, and he was uh, rose to the rank of lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. Uh, he was the chief of psychology at the Arm- Army Medical Center in Okinawa, Japan, and assistant chief of psychiatry and neuro- neurology in the office of the Surgeon General in Washington, D.C. So, and it goes on and on. So, you see, this is like not like you know some quack. <laughs> okay, this is like a very well established, very well respected psychiatrist that we are talking about. Now, the, um, the first book that he wrote uh, and the other books that he wrote, what made them unique was that he was combining the psychiatric scientific point of view with this religious sensibility. In fact, after People of the Lie came out, there were many people who criticized it that were colleagues of his and critics of his that said that it became too Christy at the end. It was just, it ended up being like a Christian book and they didn't like how that happened, but that came on to be more and more a part of his work as time went on. Um, one of the things that was central to all of his work was the idea of evil. And he came to believe that, e- that people become evil because they do not uh, in large part, because they do not face their own failures and, uh, you know, uh, their, their own, their own failures, their, their own weaknesses, their own failings, etc. Um, and so they come to attack others. And, you know, obviously we see this in all sorts of like emotionally disturbed people and just regular people too, you know, like people can't deal with what they've done. So they attack others, but this gets to another level as you'll see in his work. Uh, one of the things that Dr. Peck was very concerned with at the end, you know, the latter part of his life was his belief that, um, and this is very, very, um, you know, pivotal right now this week, he believed that there was so much evil in American culture because people didn't have a sense of community. And this was back in like the 1980s that he founded uh, the Foundation for Community Encouragement, which sought to create community um, among people in the United States. And, um, you know, this week, again, we saw how, how horrifically lacking um, we still are like so exponentially more than than we were back in the 1980s when um, this organization was started. Um, Dr. Pack married a woman named Lily Ho in 1959, and they had three children. Um, one of the things that he struggled with in his personal life was something that he taught a lot. And that was the idea that we must discipline ourselves personally, if we are going to have any kind of spiritual progress. And this was like a controversial idea when he first came out with it in the road, less travel, but that's really the essence of the book is that we need to really focus on disciplining ourselves if we are going to spiritually progress. So things like delayed gratification, um, uh, embracing suffering, you know, all these, a lot of sort of Christian ideas that he brought into um, his writings in that first book and, and later books as well, that they come up time and time again. So The Road Less Traveled, his most famous book, came out in 1978. You know, probably everybody's got a copy of this in their house, right? I don't know how many millions of copies this book has sold. Um, It consists of four parts. And in it, um, he describes the attributes that make for a fulfilled human being. And these are things that he culled from his work as a psychiatrist um, and, and, and speaking for so many years to so many thousands of patients about and seeing firsthand their unhappiness, their happiness, um, their goodness, and yes, their evil. Um, in the first part of the book, he examines, examines this idea of discipline, which he considers essential for emotional, spiritual, and psychological health. And he sees this as no less than the means of spiritual evolution. 
Um, so the other things were uh, responsibility, accept, accepting responsibility for oneself and one's actions, one's failings, et cetera, dedicating oneself to the truth. So constantly dedicating and rededicating ourselves to the truth and then balance. I think he was the guy that came up with this idea that's so ingrained in our society. Now this idea that we have to have a balanced life in order to be spiritually healthy. So in the second part of the book, uh, The Road, Road Less Traveled, Pack talks about the idea of love and what love is. And he detaches the idea of love from a lot of things that we commonly associated with, for example, romantic love, um, dependency or codependency, um, the feeling of falling in love. He detaches love from all of these popularly held connections. And um, it's really interesting how he goes into it, but we're not talking about this book today primarily, but I did want to give you this background. And the third part of the book, he talks specifically about religion and um, that's also very interesting too, how he kind of confronts people's ideas about atheism and agnosticism and um, also confronts their own, how people make their own religions. They don't even know it, um, you know, the re religion of their selves and the way he's seen this in the therapy session, the many therapy sessions that he's been involved in. Uh, so the four, fourth part of the book concerns grace, you know, this idea of this force that originates from outside of humans that allows us um, to rise above, you know, suffering, to rise above hate, to rise above, you know, fractured relationships and uh, to heal, you know, to spiritually heal. So um, it's a very interesting book. Like I said, it's a very popular book. You probably have a copy of it somewhere in your house um, or definitely, you know, know someone that does. And uh, I, again, I don't even know how many millions and millions of copies of this book that I sold. It was so influential. And, um, you know, we have this massive self-help um, culture today, mindfulness culture and everything else, largely because of Dr. Peck's book, The Road Less Traveled. So, um, so that's The Road Less Traveled. But today... We are going on to talk about specifically the people of the lie. Now, I first, um, I'm gonna go back to my notes here in a minute, but I wanna talk, talk to you about how I first encountered this book. As some of you may know, after I got divorced um, in 2008, I was seeing this man, uh, I use the term man, <laughs> loosely. And um, he's a very prominent uh, figure in our city, in our community. He was a public official, very well respected, um, you know, charismatic guy. And I got into a relationship with him. He told me that he wanted to marry me, have children with me. He said he loved my daughters. And I came over the course of the next four and a half years to discover that this person was truly evil. <laughs> and a lot of psychiatrists would call him, um, there's a term for it, a malignant narcissist. And <laughs> just from the way it sounds, you can imagine, uh, I think you can imagine what this person was like, excuse me. I mean, literally, you know, they say if his mouth was moving, he was lying, literally everything that came out of his mouth was a lie. And it was just a, a years of lies, deceit, him having, I found out he had multiple exclusive other relationships with women um, and their children uh, besides myself and mine with all the same promises. He adopted a uh, little boy and uh, he had the little boy calling all of these women mama. Uh, it was really, really sick. But um, anyways, horrible. I still suffer a lot with PTSD from this relationship. There was a lot of abuse, uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, uh, so much that was involved in it. And, um, you know, really it was the lowest point in my life. And it's been, you know, it hasn't been an easy life, but I mean, that was the worst. And it was during that time that, thank God, I found this uh, forum online uh, that was created by a woman named Lisa Scott. And she had formed this, uh, she had created this forum following the publication of her book 
um, I can't remember the name of the book now, but I will remember and I will put it in the comments or, or now in the comments in the description of this video so you can check it out if you're going through the same kind of thing. But if you look up Lisa Scott, you'll, you know, and narcissism, uh, she calls them narcs. And uh, thank God I found this forum because it was filled with hundreds of mostly women, some men who had become the victims of narcissists and sociopaths. And thank God it was only through this website and this forum that I start, started to learn about narcissism, malignant narcissism and sociopathy and psychopathy. And, you know, all the things in their playbooks and all the things that they use, such as gaslighting and triangulation and, um, you know, all the different ways that they treat people. And I started to realize that I had been targeted by one of these people and my children had been targeted by one of these people. Um, but I found a lot of wonderful resources through this forum and this book of the people of the lie was one of them, but because boy, oh boy, was this dude a person of the lie. Um, these are people who they lie, they just lie. And they, have, they write, lie for a lot of different reasons, but the main reason they lie is to control, to control people, to break people, to physically, uh, not physically, spiritually decimate people. Uh, and they're very, very good at it. Uh, so I read this book and I became really amazed at the similarities between the case studies that Dr. Peck was looking at in the book and the experience that I myself had been going through for such a long time with this person, again, in quotes, that I had become involved in. Um, so I want to just go over with you um, for a few minutes, the different cases that Dr. Peck looks at in this book. Um, so that you can uh, understand kind of what he, kind of what he was getting at and what he is talking about in this book. So there's very different people that he looks at, and there's very different ways that evil manifests in these people's lives, and how he came to realize that there was something much more wrong with these people than standard um, psychiatric diagnoses. So, okay, so the first case was the case of a man named George. Now, George was a businessman, traveling salesman, and these cases all were back in like the 50s and 60s during Dr. Peck's earlier career. So typical businessman with stay-at-home wife, and uh, he would be out on the road, you know, he would all, all often be gone, like traveling on sales calls and things like this. And one day when he was driving, he was driving home um, from a business trip, he had this sudden thought that um he I think he drove by like uh he drove over a bridge and he this he had this thought in his head the next time you drive over this bridge it's going to collapse and you're going to die and then he was like whoa that's weird why did I have that thought and then he tried to put it out of his mind and then like the next day he was driving by like a an old railroad depot that was kind of falling down and he had this voice in his head say one day you're going to find yourself in that building and the roof is going to collapse and kill you. And this would go on and on every day. And he had these obsessive thoughts that would come more and more often. And he got to the point where he couldn't take it anymore. So he sought out this psychiatric help from Dr. Peck. So they started to talk and try to figure out what was wrong with him. And Dr. Peck originally thought that he had obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, where we, he would have these obsessive thoughts about compulsions, things that he needed to do because what doctor, what, what ended up happening was that George, in order to get control over this, these thoughts that he was having, what he started to do was that he would go and he would do the things that this like voice was predicting um, to like prove to himself that it was, it didn't mean anything and didn't have any control over him. So for example, he went and he drove over that bridge that the voice told him if he drove over it again, you know, he would die. He went and, you know, walked through the old railroad depot and, and you know, came out fine. And so proved to himself it was case. So every time he had, a, a, and the thoughts continued, but every time he had one of these thoughts, he would go and do the thing to prove to himself that those thoughts had no control over what actually happened in his life. Um, 
but he thought, um, okay, well, it seems to be okay because nothing's happening to me when I go back and do these things, but maybe it just hasn't happened yet. So we thought I need to like up the ante and like give myself some extra assurance that it's going to be that, that this has no control over me. So, um, he said like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to go and go back to these places anymore. Instead, I'm going to say, if I go back to one of these places, the devil can take my soul. And then he went on to add, the devil can also kill my youngest son. He had a favorite younger son that he loved very much. It was kind of the apple of his eye. So he basically made a deal with the devil that um, if he could not overcome his compulsion to go back to these places when he had these thoughts, that um, he would exchange his soul and the life of his child, um, you know, for his failure to, you know, maintain control of the situation. So when he told Dr. Peck this, Dr. Peck was absolutely dumbfounded and he's like, and he thought to himself, this is so far beyond and so far different from an obsessive compulsive disorder. There is something seriously wrong and off with this person to have committed this act of evil. And he called him out and he said, this is evil what you did. And he said, well, I don't even believe in the devil. So who cares? And Dr. Pack tried to explain to him that it didn't matter if he believed in the devil or not, that what he had done in not just, not necessarily even pledging his own soul, but pledging his son's life. So this was uh, the first case in the book that uh, Dr. Pack talks about in People of the Lie, the book that we're talking about tonight. So case number two. Uh, parents brought in 15 year old boy named Bobby, whose older brother at 16 had committed suicide the year before by shooting himself with a rifle. Um, they brought him in to see Dr. Peck because the boy was very depressed. Bobby, the, the surviving brother, was very depressed. And um, as, fun, as uh, Dr. Peck went on to, to speak with Bobby, um, you know, it was revealed that Bobby wanted to go away to a boarding school. He didn't like his school. He didn't like being at home. And Dr. Pack asked the parents to come in and talk with him. And when they did, he discovered that there was something off with these two as well, that they seemed to have no empathy for their own child. Um, and that whatever he told them he felt as Bobby's psychiatrist that they should do to help Bobby. They just, they, they either ignored him or outright did the opposite, did the opposite thing. Uh, the most bizarre part of this uh, whole scenario was that um, when, when Bobby started to get worse, it was right after Christmas and Dr. Peck said, Bobby, didn't you have a nice Christmas? And he's like, it was okay. And he said, did you get any nice presents? And he said, I got one present. And he said, well, well, what was it? And he said, I got a gun. And he went on to tell Dr. Peck that his parents had given him for Christmas the gun that his brother had killed himself with the year before. Um, obviously dumbfounded, right? And as Dr. Peck went on to talk more with Bobby's parents, he discovered that um, they just didn't have any thoughts about him. They had no empathy for him, no compassion for him, no concern for him. And, and there also seemed to be this strain of wanting to harm him. And it was, it wasn't, and as, and he looked into this, it wasn't like it was, you know, they were angry because he was their surviving sibling, you know, maybe they liked the other one more who killed himself. It was like there was something about them that was so hateful. And he had suggested originally that he thought, you know, maybe Bobby should go away to boarding school. He suggested to me that he wanted to do that. And the parents said, really? He's never said that to us. And then like 
a minute later, they were like, oh, you know, I think maybe he did say something about that a while ago. And he was like, well, you don't remember your own child saying he wanted to go away to boarding school? And so he saw that they were covering up time and again, the fact that they didn't hear anything he said, didn't care about anything he said, didn't listen to him, had no empathy for him. And it went on and on and on. Uh, for example, Dr. Peck referred them, uh, said that he, they should take Bobby to a psychologist that was a colleague of Dr. Peck for some testing. And they just didn't do it. And when he asked him why they didn't do it, they turned it around and uh, said, oh, well, you said it was up to Bobby and he didn't seem interested in it. You know, things like that, where they would twist around what he had said. Um, so uh, yeah, so really bizarre um, situation there with two parents that just, the, their child doesn't seem to register with them at all. Okay, so case three of people of the lie, what we are talking about tonight. Roger was a, another teenager who was depressed and he had been a great student, good kid all around. And then he, out of the blue, he stole a car. Um, his parents didn't really seem to care about anything that was happening except the, that they, they were convinced that Bobby was going to become a criminal and this was gonna like make them look bad. And um, this was a situation where Dr. Pat thought that the child should probably be sent somewhere else, but that they just kind of ignored that. And then um, the child, they ended up putting the child in a private school, a parochial school, and he started to do really well and he seemed to be happy there. And then, um, when the, when he told the parents that the child seemed that uh, Roger seemed to be happy in the new school, then they sent him away to a military school. It was like the things that seemed to be helping their own child, they deliberately undermined them and changed them. Um, so it was essentially in this case and in Bobby's case, and, you know these cases that we've talked about. You're seeing someone, or in this case, you know, of parents, two people who are deliberately impeding the spiritual growth, um, the mental health, physical health of someone that they are supposed to love. I mean, they are deliberately doing it. And in each case, they're not even aware of it. They're, they don't admit it. And when they're confronted with it, they deny it. And so Dr. Peck starts to look at like, how much of this do they, are they really not aware of and how much of it are they doing deliberately? And this became a, a point of fascination for him as he went on to really delve into the idea of evil. Okay, the fourth case was a case of a husband and wife, Hartley and Sarah. Sarah was so mentally controlling and abusive of her husband, Hartley, that he had become like a small child. He couldn't drive. He couldn't go out of the house by himself. He couldn't go anywhere on his own. He couldn't hold a job. He couldn't do anything. He was totally dependent on his wife. And she, um, whenever... She, he couldn't even go to therapy by himself. She had to sit by his side the whole time. And as Dr. Peck said, everything he said, most of the time she answered for him and spoke for her husband. But um, whenever he did say anything, Dr. Peck said she ca you know, emotionally castrated him right in front of the doctor. So, you know, just said he was useless. He was a loser. He couldn't do anything. He was a child. He was not a man. He was this, 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 and this. So you see a case where someone has come, become so much in control of someone that they have ceased to really exist. And he has reverted back to being a child. Um, any spiritual development he might have had is absolutely gone. And he's back to the point of being a very young child where he has no spiritual, um, you know, uh, personality, no spiritual growth at all, um, that it hasn't even begun to form yet. So uh, again, you see this, you know, the really intense and is it intentional? Um, 
attempt to undermine, destroy, remove the spiritual uh, dimension and the spiritual growth of another human being. Uh, okay, case number five, we're talking about people of the lie, for those of you who have just come in by Dr. Scott Peck, very influential book in uh, psychiatry of the 20th century and up to the present time. Uh, Dr. Peck was a prodigy of Father Malachi Martin that we talked about last week. And we're talking about the cases that he looks at in this book, The People of the Lie. So we're on case number five. And in case number five, we have this woman, Angela. And Angela is a um, rather well-off woman, lives in Chicago. She owns apparently five apartment buildings in Chicago. Um, but Angela... Um, guilts her daughter about money and acts like she, and the, the mother acts like she's impoverished. Um, so she doesn't acknowledge uh, the wealth that she has. So her daughter um, has a terrible marriage and she ends up getting divorced and she's a child. So she's a single mother and she's really struggling working a couple jobs to support her child. And at one point um, she tries to buy a used car for, I think it was a thousand dollars. And uh, she couldn't afford, she didn't have enough money to buy it outright. So she asked her mother if she would lend her the $1,000 um, to buy this car um, and uh, so that she wouldn't have to get the, um, make the interest payments, which she couldn't afford to make the, the payments with the interest charge on each month. So the mom said, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. But then like, she was gonna give her a promissory note for the money and then it wasn't forthcoming. And then a few days later, Angela's brother calls her and he starts just like out of the blue for no reason. He never really calls her. And uh, he ends up telling Angela that the mom was recently diagnosed with breast cancer and that she has to have all of these treatments and she doesn't know if she can afford any of it. And Angela was confused because she knew that her mom was retired and she was, um, you know, had a pension. She had all of this uh, savings and investments. She had her property and she also had really good, um, you know, like uh, Medicare, whatever, you know, you would call it. So um, anyway, like the next day, she doesn't say anything about it to her mom. The next day, her mom gives her this promissory note for the $1,000. And of course, um, her daughter doesn't take it, you know, because of what her brother told her. So it was this elaborate scheme to guilt her daughter into not borrowing this money from her in which she not only lied to her daughter, lied to her son, she didn't have breast cancer, but she, you know, used her son to lie to her daughter for this, you know, just to, I don't know, keep control of her money, keep her daughter dependent on her, keep her daughter down, keep her daughter from making something of herself. I don't know. And Dr. Speck didn't know. And he just said it was amazing the the lengths that this woman went to just to make sure her daughter did not progress make sure that she kept her daughter down her own daughter um case number six a uh, woman named billy she's a woman i think in her 20s and she and her mom were very close and it was a really weird situation because her mom was still married to her dad but she said that it was a terrible marriage it was a loveless marriage and so the mom was had all these extramarital affairs and she was very promiscuous so of course the daughter grows up to be promiscuous too and uh they're like best friends and they talk to each other about all of these sexual exploits that they had really weird situation um Despite, you know, all these relationships, of course, both of them, you know, Dr. Pat could see they were both very lonely and uh, he could see Billy was not progressing at all as a young woman. She was not growing at all because she was so intertwined with her mother and Billy had this terrible phobia of spiders and Dr. Speck came to believe that the phobia represented her mother and that her mother was like a spider that had her, her tentacles in Billy's life. And it was disallowing Billy from making any kind of spiritual or emotional progress as an adult. Um, 
so that was uh, very, very strange, but there were a lot of instances in the situation too, where, you know, at the end, Billy ends up trying to get an apartment by herself to, you know, establish some independence. And uh, she has this job where she has to be at work at 6 a.m. on Thursday mornings to, um, I think it was like a publishing company and it was a day that they got like proofs to the publishers or something like that. So she often, she was in the habit of visiting with her mom on Wednesday evenings at her mom's house. And she told her mom, that her psychiatrist, Dr. Pack, had told her that she needed to make sure she got home by 9 p.m. on Wednesday nights so she could get up early uh, and be fresh for work on Thursday. And her mother would not let her go home on Wednesday nights. And she would do anything like even crying, begging, lying about you know health problems that she had to keep her daughter from getting home to bed on time so she could get up to go to work in the morning. And the, the daughter would end up just staying at her mom's house, which is what her mom wanted. She didn't want her to move out. She didn't want her to be independent. She didn't want her to succeed. Um, so again, we have this instance where the parent seems hell bent on keeping their own child from any kind of spiritual or emotional progress or success in life. Um, wanting them, wanting to be fully in control of this, uh, the other person and really just kind of absorb the other person into their own personality, uh, which Dr. Peck found as this, you know, hallmark of what he saw as evil in people. So case number seven, uh, this was the first case um, that Dr. Peck talks about in People of the Lie that we're talking about tonight. Uh, where he started to really think, is there evil in some of these people that goes beyond narcissism or even malignant narcissism? Is there something else here that really has kind of a life of its own? So this was a case of a woman named Charlene and Charlene was a young woman not super attractive, you know, just like a normal young woman, but she was very like, um, you know, upbeat, very like sexual, very, you know, like flirtatious. And she saw Dr. Peck for over four years and the entire time, because she was always, she got fired from every job she had, she couldn't stay in a relationship. But the only thing that she wanted to do in this four year, four years of seeing Dr. Peck in these weekly sessions, sometimes more, was to have a sexual conquest over him. She was determined that she was going to get him to sleep with her. And all the sessions were about, don't you think I'm attractive? Don't you want to be with me? Don't you want to hold me? Don't you want to make love to me? Don't you, you know, think I'm fascinating? Don't you think I'm this? Don't you think I'm that? Don't you want this? So every session becomes about her doing this and him trying to make her understand that this is not what she's there for. This is not an appropriate relationship. This is um, a, a, a disordered desire that she needs to confront and get over, you know, they're her wanting to have these sexual relationships with authoritative figures in her life that are trying to help her. Um, and she just refuses to acknowledge any of it. And then towards the very end of the session, and she would do things and also no boundaries. Like she would like show up in his office, like in the evening, like when he was like having dinner with his wife and he'd hear a noise in his office and she would be sitting, reading a book in his office, or she would sit in front of his house in her car at night, listening to the radio, or she would come over and sit in their garden um, for no reason. And he would tell her over and over again, like, you can't do the, these things. And she would just say, why not? And she just didn't, she just couldn't comprehend why any of these things were, were not okay. So towards the end of their sessions, after these four years, um, she admits to him that the reason, the, 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 the reason she keeps doing this is because she, uh, or he confronts the fact that he lies to her all the time about all different kinds of things. And she admits that she does it for fun. Um, cause she likes to, to be in control of people, what people think about her, what people know about her. So she lies to, to 
retain control. And he is just bewildered and says, bewildered and says, you know, I think you are evil and doesn't bother her at all that he says this about her. And he started because of seeing her to start to learn about evil and the, the idea of evil in psychology and psychotherapy and psychiatry. And he learns about Malachi Martin and he reads Hostage to the Devil. Um, he makes the acquaintance of Malachi Martin and he comes to wonder if maybe this girl Charlene could benefit from an exorcism. And he brings it up to her one day and he's uh, because she jokes about it. She says, uh, he says like, I, you know, again, I, I think you're evil. And she says, do you happen to know an exorcist? And she laughs. And he said, you know, in fact, I do. Would you be interested in talking to him? And uh, at that point, something changed. And the next session that she came in, she was the perfect patient. She laid, came into the office, laid down on his couch and spent the entire hour and a half, I think it was, talking about, you know, her thoughts about herself, her feelings, her childhood. And at the end of the session, he was like, what, where did that come from? I've been waiting four years for you to be honest with me, to tell me, to open up, to talk to me about yourself and your feelings. And she said, I just wanted to show you that I can do it. I just chose not to. Um, and he said, well, I hope you'll continue to do that in our future sessions. And she said, I'm never coming back. So when he asked her if she would be interested in talking to an exorcist, that was the end of their four-year relationship. Kind of interesting, isn't it? But now, uh, Dr. Peck uh, wasn't sure. Um, in fact, he came to believe that Charlene and that these other people that he talked to were not necessarily possessed by the devil, like other people that he came to see as he got involved in exorcisms later on. Um, during his practice. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. It's also kind of weird. Um, he did wonder if these people that we've talked about, these seven cases, if these people were what uh, Father Malachi Martin called uh, perfectly possessed. Remember, I, I think we talked about this last week. Malachi Martin talk about a kind of person that is perfectly possessed. And this is someone that is not like being diabolically attacked. You know, it's not in the throes of possession is not, you know, acting out and swearing and cursing and uh, having all these outbursts. They have allowed the demon to completely possess them and completely take them over, take over their soul, their body, their mind. They're not fighting it at all. And he calls these people perfectly possessed. In fact, not just him, it's, it's a term that exorcists use for people who have allowed themselves, uh, who've given themselves over to the devil completely. And uh, uh, it's uh, really a really frightening thing. Apparently there's a, a lot of people who are like this. And I, I wonder if that guy that I talked to you about that I had been involved with if he is like that it certainly seems to be that way other family members I, I really wonder how widespread this is um, so perfectly possessed now we get into of course you know when when Dr. Peck introduces the idea of possession and exorcism into his practice into his theories uh, as a psychiatrist he gets a lot of blowback and he first talked about it, I think in, um, did he talk about it in The Road Less Traveled? I think he talked about evil and the possibility of evil, um, but then in People of the Lie, I mean, it's really a lot of it is about this. In fact, towards the end of uh, the second part of the book, he talks about um, two cases of possession that he was involved in, two cases of possession and exorcism. And we find out later on when he writes a later book called Glimpses of the Devil, that he was somehow the exorcist in these cases as part of his practice. Um, so I'm gonna get to this in a second, but um, he introduces this idea of possession and exorcism in the second part of uh, People of the Lie. 
And, uh, and then he goes on also to talk about um, group evil. Um, he talks a lot about evil in the military. He talks about evil uh, in the context of President Johnson and the Vietnam War. And uh, it's, also, it's very interesting, but probably a topic for another day, group evil and uh, you know things like uh, cults and, and stuff like that. But um, at any rate, um, what happens to Dr. Peck? I'm not sure what happens with him religiously, spiritually, theologically at this point, because like I said, at the age of 40, he becomes a Christian, he gets baptized and he says he's like an evangelical Christian, but he still has a lot of these ideas that he talked about in the road less traveled, which are not Christian ideas and they're not biblical ideas, like ideas like that, you know, God, maybe God's a woman, um, you know, that, you know, uh, we have to make like our own, uh, truth, you know, our own reality, things like that. Uh, I, the idea that Jesus was just like an advanced spiritual person, you know, the, the idea we can attain this, I think he might've been one of the roots of that widespread idea that we have now of this, you know, Christ consciousness that we can all supposedly obtain. Um, but apparently at some point, um, and as far as I can tell, he was never ordained and to be a minister or anything like that, but he, um, and it wasn't deliverances that he was doing. We talked in another episode about deliverance work. This is something that lay people can do where we can, can have deliberate deliverance teams and do deliverance prayers over someone that is not possessed, but someone who has like is under demonic attack. So something who's at a, someone's at a, who's at a lesser stage, sometimes it can be dealt with by lay people, uh, usually working together as a team on a, what we call a deliverance from this, um, you know, this attack by the diabolical. Um, because he mentions in People of the Lion, he mentions in Glimpses of the Devil, deliverance ministry. And uh, he makes the distinction that what he was involved with was not deliverance ministry, but that it had advanced to exorcism. So the person was deemed to be possessed and this was exorcism that had happened. And uh, so I'm not sure how he came to be an exorcist, a self-prescribed exorcist. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. I'll say, I'll, you know, we've talked about in the Catholic church, I mean, there's only a Catholic priest can do an exorcism, um, deliverance ministry. Yeah, sure. And other Christian denominations can do this, but as far as an exorcism, there's only one person who can do that. And that is the priest, um, in persona Christi and, you know, standing in for Christ. So, um, it all gets very shady, just like Malachi Martin, like at the end where we're not really sure what's going on. Like, is this an authorized person doing exorcisms? Is he just sitting in on them? Um, what actually is he? Is he part of some church? Is he not part of some church? What are his spiritual beliefs? We do see uh, towards the end of Dr. Peck's life that he starts to develop more of this global religious idea, you know, that all religions are one and we're all, you know, kind of working on the same thing. We all have kind of the same goals and the same ideas and, you know, um, something Bishop Barron talks about all the time that always gets him into trouble, this idea that all religions have like parts of the truth. So, you know, every, everyone's okay. Cause they're all, you know, working with part of the truth. Um, so he, you know, he really comes to embrace more of this global consciousness, new age type of thing that I think he was really largely responsible for beginning, not only in the United States, but, you know, something that has taken over a lot of the world now, this new age kind of global, uh, thought where the person is, you know, has to makes their own truth. The person uh, becomes their own Christ and, and all of these kinds of uh, errors that we see spread all through self-help and, and uh, all through our culture. So um, aside from that, um, I think that Dr. Peck's books are really interesting. I think he made a lot of headway in his study of evil in a psychiatric um, context. 
And I think he's very influential to a lot of other uh, psychiatrists as well. Um, I don't know if she was influenced by him, but um, we talked about this book. I think it was maybe the second or third episode of the series that we did when we talked about The Unquiet Dad by Dr. Edith Fiore. This was the psychiatrist who claimed that she had thousands of patients um, who she found she believed were possessed by spirits. And I talked about my spirit release therapy that I went through a couple of years ago and, um, and all of that. So you see, you know, in psychiatry and in psychotherapy, you see this movement to recognize these kinds of things. And Dr. Peck believed that during his lifetime, um, demonic possession would be recognized as a mental illness, you know, and I think, don't quote me on this, and I'm not going to say it is, but I think spirit possession is recognized as a mental illness. I mean, whatever, you know, psychiatry means by that, um, I'm not sure if they mean someone is, you know, possessed by the devil, but, um, or by a spirit by an evil spirit, but I believe there is some sort of a diagnosis that differentiates this from, for example, schizophrenia or something like that. But I will look that up and I'll put it in the description. Um, at any rate, I hope you've enjoyed this little look into one of um, Malachi Martin's most famous protégés, Dr. M. Scott Peck. You can uh, find all, I think you can find uh, some of uh, his most famous books like People the Lie and The Road Less Traveled for free uh, to read online, at least big parts of them on Google Books. You can also probably get the ebook pretty cheaply. They're definitely in your library, guaranteed. So People of the Lie, The Road Less Traveled and Glimpses of the Devil, including, um, I think he wrote a dozen books total. So definitely, you know, Take the religious aspects with a grain of salt because I think um, he was on a long spiritual journey and didn't figure everything out as um, a lot of us don't um, by the end, but um, he was definitely trying to figure it out and he definitely, you know, he was open to the possibilities of that there is a world out there that's beyond our brains, you know, that, and he saw this in person after person, you know, throughout his career that sat in the chair in his therapy room, he saw that there was something else present in their brain that wasn't them. It wasn't a part of them. And he was fascinated by this possibility and determined to make sense of it, make some sense of it so that he could help people combat it. And uh, I think in that he was definitely successful. So, um, I hope you check out the books. I will put the links on Amazon to the books. I'll see if I can find the free versions online and put those links too if I can find them. Uh, so thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you being here. Please like the video, share the video on social media, email, whatever. Ask your friends to subscribe to the channel. Please you subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so that you get notified whenever I come out with a new video. And it's not only part of this Present Darkness series, but I also do a bunch of other stuff too on here, interviews, book reviews, mini documentaries, and all kinds of lectures and stuff. So make sure that you hit that notification bell so you get notified every time we put something new up. Uh, next week, I'm not sure what we're talking about yet, <laughs> but I will be right here on Thursday night please write to me, Ursula Bielski at sbcglobal.net with your suggestions for shows, with your questions about theology, um, paranormal research, um, spirituality, um, concerns, comments, hate mail. I'll take it all. I would love to talk about it on air. So please, Ursula Bielski at sbcglobal.net. I uh, will see you right, right here next Thursday. And until then, you have a great night. Bye.